Hi, I'm Lauren Kennedy and welcome to episode 117 of Art This Week. This week we visit Holly Johnson Gallery and speak with John Adelman about his work in the exhibition Trace Evidence, Recent Work by John Adelman. Now for Art This Week. I'm Caroline Belanger and welcome to Art This Week. Today we're speaking with John Adelman at Holly Johnson Gallery about his current exhibition, Trace Evidence. And so before we get into talking about this exhibition specifically, I was wondering if we could just go back a little bit and talk about where your work kind of came to fruition, how you define that, you know, your process. You know, it's, you've got this rule-based art. How do you define those rules? Uh, from the very beginning, or at least when I got started on this, what I was doing was I was using gelling pens on paper and I was essentially making colored field drawings. Mm -hmm. So I'd stack the, the layers of the writing and this is all, like in this particular piece, everything you see is nothing but words. Mm -hmm. And I would stack those on top of each other, layer after layer, usually anywhere from about 8 to 14 layers, and just create um, just uh, color fields, these dense sort of patterns that would fall out of them. And then the colors as they were uh, placed on top of each other so would do their own sorts of things. I'd get a lot of purples even though I never use a purple. Uh, and then see how the blues and the blacks mix together. This here, uh, I actually then uh, added an additional blue to. And so this is a separate sort of a, a blue almost teal that comes here that I stayed separate from the rest of the, the work itself. Now in these pieces here, I'll run all the way to the very end with the writing, but I never break a word. And the words that I get all come from the dictionary. So each piece just picks up where the last one left off. This is titled bowl, but it has nothing to do with that definition or with that word other than whatever parameters I've set forth from the, at that moment. So if the dictionary breaks up a word, then I can break it up. If it keeps it whole, then I keep it whole. If it's capitalized, I capitalize. All numbers are written out completely in long form. I never use any punctuation or any of the pronunciations. Mm -hmm. But etymology, that sort of stuff I use. So all of that's in case there. And then from here, I believe the next piece right after this is actually called ceaselessly. So all the definitions from bull to that are what's in, contained in this particular work here. And that's where it all sort of came from. And when you're, of, you're using words, is there any rhyme or reason? Do you go in an alphabetical order? Do you the very create a sentence? Or do the words have a relationship with each other? Uh, I just got right straight out of the dictionary. So I started with the, you know, with the letter A and with the very first definition being A. And I just go until whatever parameters I've set up for the drawing are complete. Mm -hmm. Once they're complete, that's when the drawing stops and the next drawing picks up right where that's left off with its own parameters. Whatever uh, word I start with, that's its title. Mm -hmm. So within that, if you know all the titles of the pieces, you know the chronology of the work too. You know when it fits within the greater scheme of the entire body of work as well. You don't only just use words, you'll also use, you trace nails. And how do you make that decision of what kind of object or language you're going to use? This is probably a rather esoteric argument, but um, for a long time I argued when I wrote a word, it was really truly that word. The fact you couldn't read it because it was stacked on top of, you know, another 10 other words was irrelevant. It was still the real thing. So I wanted to keep drawing as real as possible and I wanted to keep it as um, open to my the viewers as I could. And so I had sort of two options when it came to objects. I could either do rubbings of those objects. I thought that would be a really true representation of it because that was sort of the texture of the object, which is a real thing. Or I could trace the object, which would be sort of the outline of that object. And I thought that would be the, the truest, real way that I could represent something. Uh, that's how it started. Uh, I started with the nails simply because, um, for whatever reason, you know, and I'm probably like everybody else, you see those going out of business sales and you're driving down the highway and you see that, you know, 80% off. And it doesn't matter what they're selling, you're thinking, I should go in there and check it out because it's 80% off. Mm -hmm. And the only stores I ever went to, though, happened to be the hardware stores. And I don't know what it is, I just started buying the nails. 
And so uh, when I got started, I had this whole group of nails and I thought, geez, there's a, there's a huge commodity of something small, just like a dictionary contains a huge commodities of essentially a lot of words, whether they're defined or being defined. And um, so I just started with the nails and I just took all my nails, dumped them directly onto the uh, paper itself mm -hmm. and, and then went from there. And then it just keeps evolving from there into you know, some that have more structure, some that have more variables. This probably has about the most complicated structure and this is the, the newest work in the entire show. This is all objects that have been traced and then the word of whatever that object is written on top of it are usually just off to the right hand corner of the object. But each time after I took a break or after I started a new day, I would choose one object which would be my foreground. Mm -hmm. And that nothing could enter into that particular space no matter where I threw it. Everything, if, it threw, if I threw it there and it landed, then it, couldn't, it, be, it either couldn't be whole into the space or I had to remove it. But only one object each time after I took a break. And so that's how each one of these things pop up. But after the second break, you know, when I came back and I chose another object to be my main foreground object, the other piece now could be covered up. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I was developing a range within the work there. So that's been the most complex in terms of the stacking, the layering on how things have gone down. Uh, sometimes they're fairly uh, straightforward, I guess straightforward for me anyways. Like in this piece right here, this is 14 TVs. And I chose 14 TVs that were basically about uh, almost the cubes in, in different sizes. And I started with my smallest TV, a small like eight inch, very early TV. Mm -hmm. and. I placed it when I took it apart right in the center here, mm -hmm. but I positioned it almost about a 2.30 position on a clock face because that's the time I started the drawing itself oh, wow. so that that sort of is embedded into it. And that's where everything is located in terms of you just have to find the right angle to where I started that particular one. But then the next sized one. Uh, from there, I think it's uh, right here, I think it's this one right here, and then it goes from there until finally I got this massive, almost console style, 24-inch uh, TV, which is this main outer one right here. Mm -hmm. And what are these kind of elements that you can see in the, the dark? Most people generally miss those, which I never bring them up. Okay. Because no, because <laughs> I've asked the forbidden question. <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good one because it's actually the home entertainment system which everybody wants to hide in their house. So you move the speakers around. So I did these, so there is actually an entire uh, receiver system and then four speakers that were done in black that are trying to hide itself just as you would in your own sort of home entertainment center. Mm -hmm. so, that, and so I never bring those up unless somebody else does it. So, you know, it's just like if you had your house, you don't pick out, hey, look at the big woofer I got over there or something like that. So I just, you know, they're there and they, you know, they are part of the piece, but they're also supposed to be, you know, uh, in their own place and, and away from it. How do you choose your, your substrate? like? versus paper versus board versus do you do anything on canvas or is it all board? Yeah, the, the uh, nail cascading piece is on yeah. canvas and I started mounting paper onto uh, board as well here just recently in the last few pieces I've done. Like, do you and prefer one over the other? Does just it pure paper is, is, is ideal and I usually use about a 300 pound uh, watercolor paper mm -hmm. but every once in a while you know I'll have uh, just a real desire to try something new. Um, I like to, you know, vary things up. You know, I'll write for a while for a couple pieces, then I want to move to objects. So same as with materials uh, that way. I work on a uh, material like this, which is really, really hard and difficult physical material to work on. It's very straining. So then I want to go back to uh, the uh, paper, which is a little bit more forgiving, a little bit more of a, a, a surface to it. Or if I want something that's really um, 
was sort of abrasive, then I'll go to the canvas because you can get a really, really hard surface. Mm -hmm. And then you get a, vari a varied surface as well when the, the, the uh, pens pick it up. So the pen will react to different surfaces as well. Well, I imagine paper would have a, much, a better saturation with, with the ink and then also achieve a more velvety texture. Uh, especially, it, gets, it literally gets that sort of surface when there are larger pieces and I have to really strain to get to other spots. Mm -hmm. uh, because because then I'm physically laying on the paper and you're rubbing against it and of course my arms are always on the paper moving around it so physically they can become that way. We want to thank John for speaking with us. The exhibition is up through August 20th, 2011. More information on John can be found at thejohnadelman.com. More information on the exhibition and the gallery can be found at hollyjohnsongallery.com. That's it for it this week. Thanks for watching. I thought that was kind of getting to be enough before you're back through it. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were wincing because he's like, he's moving again. No! I just did, this is my second shoot, so uh, uh, okay. still, <laughs> I'm good. I could have asked 10 more questions, but I, was, I saw you make a face. I was like, okay, I've had to hold that camera for an interview before, and it's like, <laughs>